It's International Women's Day and welcome to the motherhood penalty at the British Library, feeling very topical as more kids go back to school and many of us collapse to our knees after a year of increasing gender inequality and unpaid labour. Luckily, this event is about how to challenge that. I'm Bea Rolat of the cultural events team at the British Library, and I'm delighted to welcome the unvanquishable force of nature that is Joely Brearley and her new book, Pregnant Then Screwed. And she will be in conversation with Eliane Glazer. Eliane is the author, among other books, of Motherhood, A Manifesto, which is available now for pre-order. Please do that. It's coming out in May. As well as writing books, Eliane also works as a radio producer. Um, she's a research fellow at the University of London and writes for numerous publications. She's also a mum and it's her birthday. Happy birthday, Eliane, and thanks for joining us on this day. Um, so everybody that's joined us uh, via, via your Zoom links, please have an extra slice of cake for Eliane. And with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, B. And it's a nice birthday to have International Women's Day. So I'm really happy to be speaking to Jolie Brearley today. She is, um, as B says, an absolute um, firebrand campaigner, mother and founder of Pregnant Then Screwed. Jolie writes for many outlets, including The Telegraph and The Independent. And The Observer has named her as one of its 50 new radicals. She's also the winner of the Northern Power Women Agent for Change Award. And her new book, Pregnant Then Screwed, The Truth About the Motherhood Penalty and How to Fix It, is really vital, timely, and also brilliantly and hilariously written. I laughed out loud and read many bits out to my um, partner and kids. <laughs> so really enjoyed it, but obviously, so topical at the moment as the pandemic has highlighted so many of the issues um, around being um, a pregnant woman and a mother and trying to combine that with work. So we'll be talking about the pandemic um, uh, later on. But um, I'd like you really to start by telling us your story, really, how what propelled you to to start campaigning on, on this vital issue? And I should also say to the audience that um, there'll be a chance for you to ask your questions of, of Jolie later. So please do send them in um, as Jolie and I um, uh, are in discussion. So Jolie, please start us off and tell us how this all began for you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a real honour uh, to be asked to talk on this momentous day, International Women's Day, still swimming our way through a pandemic. Um, so let me take you back to 2013, a far less jaded, much less saggy version of me. I was, um, at the time, I, I had been working in the art sector and then I moved into the digital sector. And at this point in time, I was managing a year long project for a children's charity, which I had designed and had secured all the funding for. And I had discovered I was pregnant. It wasn't planned, but I won't go into too much detail about that. And I informed my employer when I was four months pregnant. And I did so by email. I set everything out. I realized, of course, that this could cause them a few administrative headaches. But I thought, right, I've got a plan. There's nothing for them to worry about. I'll send them an email and then we'll discuss everything the next day. And it's all going to be fine. So I emailed them the next day, the phone rang. I thought, oh, they're calling to congratulate me. How lovely. And I couldn't answer the phone because I was actually brushing my teeth at the time. And when I picked up the phone to listen to the answer phone message, all it said was, I'm sorry to tell you, Jolie, but your contract has been pulled. Please hand everything over immediately. That's all it said. And I was completely shocked. I was terrified. I had no idea how I was gonna pay my rent. I had no idea how I was gonna pay for food. Obviously I was four months pregnant. Who was going to employ a visibly pregnant woman? So I really didn't think I had any chance of getting another job. And I thought, this is absolutely insane. Of course, this is completely illegal. The law's going to protect me. 
So I'm going to get a solicitor and I'm going to do something about it. Managed to find a lawyer. They said, yes, this sounds like discrimination. We're going to write a letter to the charity demanding you be compensated for lost earnings. So they did that. The charity just threw that letter in the bin. That process cost me £250 and I had no idea where my next paycheck was coming from. So hemorrhaging that type of money was really frightening. And so then I said, well, what's what do I do now? And they said, you would have to take them to tribunal. I said, how much is that going to cost me? They said £9,000. <laughs> and of course... I mean, I could barely scrape together £250, let alone the £9,000. So I said, okay, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, I attended a routine doctor's appointment and discovered that my cervix had almost vanished. My tiny four-month-old baby was hanging on by a thread, essentially, and they suddenly panicked. I remember seeing the colour drain out of the doctor's face as they were examining me, and they said, we're going to have to rush you into surgery straight away. Took me into surgery, did this really delightful process where they tried to bolt my cervix together to keep the baby in place. And when I was in the recovery unit, the doctor came over and said, whatever you do, don't get stressed. This, this bolting together of your cervix may not fix the issue. The baby still may come. It only works on about 20% of our patients. So you really need to reduce as much stress in your life as possible because that is what will trigger early onset labor. And if you go into labor now, your baby will die. So within two days, I had lost my job. And my identity was so firmly attached to my work that it really massively felt like the rug had been pulled from under me. I was completely dependent on my partner to pay for my keep. I had no money of my own. And I felt like all I was good for was as a vessel to grow this baby. But actually, I wasn't even doing that very well. I was failing at that. And so I... I, I completely gave up and I remember lying on the sofa and just watching oh, God awful daytime TV and just crying for days and thinking, I, I don't really know what to do next. And I just felt so powerless. All of my power had just been stripped within a couple of days. And it, it was that moment that completely radicalized me. It, it changed my perspective on everything. And before that happened, I probably wouldn't have described myself as a feminist. You know, I, I always thought I had equal opportunities to men as a white middle-class woman. I hadn't really fully faced discrimination until that moment. And that, it just changed everything. And, um, so it wasn't, I didn't start pregnant and screwed there. And then it took a couple of years of letting the anger and the rage sort of drip feed. And I, I did eventually get another job and actually it, it turned out really well for my career, but it never left me. It ate away at me that this had happened. And it was International Women's Day 2015 that I woke up and thought, right, I'm going to do something about this today. I'm going to make sure that this never happens to another woman again. And so I scooped my baby out of the cot, Theo, who is now a very healthy seven-year-old. He survived, he was fine. I took him downstairs and bound, while bouncing him on one knee and spoon feeding him porridge, I taught myself how to use WordPress. And by the middle of the day, a website was born and it was called Pregnant Then Screwed. And it was a place for women to tell their stories anonymously of pregnancy and maternity discrimination. Right. And so you managed to channel that terrible experience into this great campaigning effort. But I'm glad that you answered that question early on about, you know, I'm sure you must have had this question loads of people asking, surely this is illegal. You know, um, how, how could your employer even do this? And actually, what you really set out clearly in the book is that even though the law is there to protect women in theory, in practice, bringing a tribunal is incredibly expensive and out of the reach of, was it 99% of women who suffer discrimination, as you say. So, and 
after having set up pregnant and screwed, you've heard the stories of lots of women who have had similar experiences. And I guess um, that discrimination has happened all along the way from informing that their employer they they were pregnant to um, you know, dismissal during maternity leave, but, and then further down the line, when mothers ask to reduce their hours, they can face discrimination and, and, um, and even dismissal at, at, at that point as well. So what kinds of experiences have you documented? Uh, we, I mean, there's such a mix of experiences of discrimination and it can be everything from bullying and harassment to outright sackings. I mean, my experience is actually extreme and quite rare. It tends to be, what tends to happen to women is they announce their pregnancy and this sort of subtle change happens where their personal development reviews will go from excellent to substandard. They're suddenly left out of meetings. Perhaps they move their death or, or they tell them they're not they're not welcome to a certain training session or and it's it, it's much more subtle than what happened to me and um, obviously there are lots of women that are made redundant because it's very hard to prove you've been made redundant because you're pregnant there are lots of women that are demoted or just your career completely stagnates and all those promotion opportunities just vanish before your eyes one of my favorite, say favorite, that's probably the wrong word. One of a story I like to tell because I think this is a good indicator of the types of things that often happen was a woman who was working for the same employer for six years. Her boss came to her and said, look, you're doing really well. We want to give you a promotion, but you have to go for an interview. It's just a formality. The job is in the bag. You just need to go through this process. Before the interview, she told him that she was pregnant, went for the interview, didn't get the job. When she asked him why, he said he had discussed things with his wife and they had decided that her priorities would change, which is just so indicative of this notion that women will become distracted and less committed once they've had children, that they just will not be interested in their job or their career anymore, as if we can't have multiple priorities simultaneously or care about multiple things at the same time. And rather than speaking to her and airing these concerns with her in advance, he just decided that it would be best if he didn't put this pressure on her. You go from that story to a woman who told her employer she was pregnant and was bullied and harassed so viciously by her employer and her colleagues that she went into labor prematurely. And when she was in the neonatal clinic with her baby who could have died, her boss called her and made her redundant. So there were these really vicious, horrific experiences. And then this much more subtle, sort of trying to be kind, thinking that this is just what women need, kind of, kinds of experiences. But alongside of that, you also get, there was a woman who told us she was made to do a shot of vodka every morning to prove she wasn't pregnant. Her and her other female colleagues, her boss would sit them down, give them all a shot of vodka and say, we need to prove you're not pregnant. So you'll do that shot of vodka every morning. I mean, she didn't let, stay for very long. She left. Uh, I've had so many different stories from women who announced their pregnancy and their boss told them to have an abortion. Women who were told to get a coat hanger for that baby or that they were going to put some medicine in the water cooler to make sure the baby didn't survive. Um, and then horrific stories about women returning to work and finding that their desk had vanished or somebody was sitting in their desk and they didn't exist on the staffing list. They'd been completely forgotten about. They'd been on maternity leave. They'd done a staffing restructuring, completely forgotten that she existed. So there's, there's these really odd, awful, awkward experiences. And then there's really brutal discrimination. Very interesting you talking about these subtle barriers that can emerge um, at work that, as you say, it's not outright discrimination, but it's these little incompatibilities between work and family life. So meetings arranged at five o'clock or kind of semi-mandatory after work socialising. And I'm really interested in that because what you say in the book um, 
you say it's really interesting, you make a really interesting point in the book about choice and, and the rhetoric of choice that we have today, in that previously, you know, it was clear there were barriers to, to women working, but now if a woman leaves her job, she's, she's supposed to have just walked out the door by her own volition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, society and employers can kind of wash their hands of the problem and just say, well, it was her choice to spend more time with her um, children. So can you talk a bit about that rhetoric of choice and how it kind of obscures the problems that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's the most infuriating thing. It, it's often the argument that you get back from people. Well, you know, women choose to spend more time with their children, so they, they are walking away from their careers. And then the notion of choice is kind of ridiculous because choices are influenced by so many different factors. They're influenced by legislation. They're influenced by culture. They're influenced by your friends and family. And in the UK, women make very different choices to what they make in other countries and cultures. So if you look at Scandinavia, there are far more mothers in work than there are in the UK because they have better systems and structures to support mothers to go back into work. Um, so we, when people say, we, it's not the gender pay gap is about the choices women make. That's often what people say. Sure, some women do choose to stay at home with their children, but some women who desperately want to stay home with their children can't because we live in an economy where both parents have to work to be able to survive, to be able to pay their rent. In 2016, in one income earning families, 46% of those families lived in poverty. In two income earning families, only 11% of those families lived in poverty. So we know absolutely that in the majority of families, mothers have to work. And yet at the same time, we're told, well, you should really be looking after your children. One in three Brits think women with children under five shouldn't be working at all. Only 7% of Brits think women should be, with children under five should be working full time. In 2006, Boris Johnson said the children of working mothers are more likely to mug you. You know, we've got all of these subtle and not so subtle messages saying to women, get back and go and look after your kids. What are you doing? You shouldn't be at work. Your responsibility is at home. But at the same time, their responsibility is to bring money in so that their children don't live in poverty. So they're pulled in these two completely different directions. And when I did a poll asking working mothers, how many of them wanted to leave their job, quit their jobs and stay at home. I can't remember the exact statistics, but it was a very high percentage said, yes, I want to quit my job and stay at home with my kids. When I asked stay at home mothers, what percentage of them wanted to be working? It was about 83% said they wanted to be working. So there isn't any choice. We have to, we have to play the best hand within the cards that we are dealt. And we have the second most expensive childcare system in the world. We have paternity leave that doesn't work. And that means that mothers are the ones that are taking time out in those early days to care for their children. Only 14% of jobs are advertised as flexible and the majority of mothers need flexible work in order to deal with their all the unpaid labor and the paid labor they have to do, but there's so few jobs that work for them. So we're just sort of, we're, we're just trying to do our best. It's not really about choice at all. Exactly. And can we talk a bit about guilt? Because, um, you know, a free choice is not really free if one side is kind of valued more than the other. So that the, the kind of public disapproval of working mums means that it's not a free choice. <laughs> And actually, you know, the, the, you talk about guilt a lot in the book and, you know, which is it's endemic amongst working mothers who just we always feel like we're not um, being proper mothers and also not being fully committed workers and failing at everything. And that's been, you know, obviously under the microscope and magnified um, during the last couple of months. So, um, yeah, but you also say in the book, you know, more, you make the more general point about let's take the pressure off us ourselves as mothers and actually this incredible statistic that um is it sort of well as maybe sort of better off parents spend more time with their children now than they did 50 years ago so so how does guilt play into all of this and how do we take the pressure off ourselves so that we can 
manage um, this combination of work and family more easily. I mean, it, it is like a pressure cooker. Christine Armstrong talks about this very well, actually, uh, who is also an author, that we, we, the guilt is, the guilt is ensuring we do, we work really hard and we work really long hours. The number, the average number of hours that we work in the UK has just increased from nine hours a day to 11 hours a day. That's the average working day in the UK at the moment. 11 hours a day and then on top of that you've got your children that you want to spend time with and as you just mentioned we're spending more time with our kids than we did 50 years ago yet we're made to feel like we don't spend any time with our children if we're working that's not true the statistics don't show that at all we're actually spending more time with our children so how we fit all this in is is just impossible 11 hours of working all this time we're spending with our children and we're spending no time on ourselves when actually the research shows that spending time on yourself, looking after yourself, the term self-care, which I actually don't like, but but we'll use it because you all know what, what it means, is really good for kids. Women looking after themselves is really good for their whole families, yet we, we, just, we don't have time to do it. So we are living in this complete pressure cooker and we're constantly feeling, particularly at the moment, that we're not doing anything well. We are not doing very well in our paid work. We're not available 24 seven to our employees when we're made to feel like we should be. And we're not, we're not teaching our children nursery rhymes and how to cook chocolate cakes and, you know, I don't know how to play the piano and be Mozart by the time they're 10. And, you know, there is, there is more pressure, I think, on mothers now to be better mothers than there was 50 years ago I mean you know I didn't live 50 years ago and perhaps there'll be some slightly older mothers than me saying that's not true at all but I know when I was a kid my mum just threw me out of the house first thing in the morning and I'd just cycle around and play with other children and then turn back up for my dinner a bit later and of course you can't do that anymore that doesn't happen so much anymore and we're also have this enormous pressure to stimulate our children constantly and it's it's tough it's really hard and it means that we feel horrendously guilty a lot of the time and that's no good for anybody and that brings us nicely to the pandemic and how that has ex exaggerated these problems that you've highlighted that have been going on many years before this last year and 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 I suppose the pandemic, you know, it's really shown up lots of different things. You know, it's, it's been the removal of school, which is, if you like, the state helping women with childcare as much as anything else. But um, and it's also shown up, you know, these tensions between work and home life. But also it's shown up these gaping inequalities between men and women in the home. And actually, there's been some really depressing statistics that have come out. Um, there's a Mums Net poll released today that... Um, that uh, where they showed that 73 percent of women are doing the laundry 70 percent did homeschool um and so and, I, and that was really surprising to me how those inequalities were revealed this is a new situation it's not just about ingrained patterns but actually you've got this new situation which is children at home and and yet you know these equalities are if, if anything getting worse so that was very worrying i think and so let's talk about about dads and inequality. Um, so what what role? How do dads fit into this? Um, and um, you know, obviously, we don't want to set up mums and dads in a sort of zero sum game. Um, and that there is the state and employers that should be helping as well. But but what about the pandemic and what it's revealed? So I think when the schools first closed and uh, we were all in lockdown we were all sort of trying to feel our way with uh, work, paid work and all this unpaid labor that we had to do. And what we found from the research, the Institute of Fiscal Studies found that for every one hour of uninterrupted paid work done by women, fathers were doing three hours of uninterrupted paid work. And that the only time the unpaid work was being shared equally between a mother and a father was when a father had been furloughed so he wasn't doing any paid work and a mother was continuing to do her paid job 
I mean, that that's just not on, is it? That's not okay. And of course, that's had a really serious impact on women's employment. Their earnings have depleted massively and redundancies are really high for mothers and will continue to grow over the coming months. The, the positive thing I think we can draw from this is that for some I mean, for the majority of dads, they've been exposed to all of this unpaid labour in a way that they never have been exposed to it before. They've seen the dirty side of looking after the kids because dads are usually the ones that do the bath time and the playtime and the fun stuff. I'm not just saying this, you know, this isn't my necessarily my personal experience. All of the research shows that, that the dads are fun time dads, the mums do the scraping of encrusted porridge and the telling off because uh, they've, the kids have sworn I don't know um so they they have been exposed to this other side of uh looking after the children and all of the dirty homework that has to be done for some dads they've had to take on all of that work because they their partner will be a key worker and so they've had to be out of the home and this work has to be done and so I would hope that in, on some level, this will start to hack away at those deeply entrenched gender stereotypes. But the key point to make, I think, is that dads aren't just, I don't, they're not just holding their hands up and saying, not my responsibility. It's not about them just being completely lazy. The whole system and structure is set up to push mothers into this role. And so we have a shared parental leave system that is naffle use to anybody. It does not encourage dads to take time out in those early days to care for their children. Only 2% of eligible dads use it, yet we know 85% of dads want to spend more time with their kids. And if we had a parental leave system like they have in Scandinavia, where they have ring-fenced, properly paid, paternity leave we know that the numbers of dads taking time out in those early days would rock it it would be enormous in Iceland it's 90% of dads take three months out to care for their kids in those early days and that starts to close the domestic labor gap so it would mean that dads are continue to do more of the childcare, more of the cooking more of the cleaning and so that would have, if we'd have had that in place before the pandemic, we wouldn't have seen those horrific statistics. We ju they just wouldn't have been there. So, yeah, I mean, it's really important to say that. I mean, dads are trying and a lot of them are working their absolute socks off to bring home the bacon because the mother doesn't have equal access to the labour force. She, so she either is staying at home with the children or she's working part time, in which case she'll be paid on average five pound less per hour than her full time counterparts. So she's earning not what she's worth. And so the, the dad often has to work his absolute socks off in order to bring home the money to keep a roof over their head. So it's not that they're being lazy. It's that the system isn't working for families. Yeah, and we're going to talk about solutions in a moment, but just staying with the pandemic, um, um, Pregnant Then Screwed have set up an SOS um, line to record women's experiences during the pandemic, um, so pregnant and women and mothers, and I think we're able to play um, a, an excerpt of, of some of those uh, recorded experiences. Reach the PTS SOS line. This is the Pregnant Then Screwed Scream or Shout line. This is your chance to rant, rave, scream or shout about your experiences as a mum during the pandemic. Let rip and tell us what this year has really been like for mums. I have hit my mummy limit. I told my five-year-old tonight, I am done with being a mummy for today. Please, please, please make this stop. I just can't keep going. This has been, it's been relentless. Every single one of us, pregnant or uh, new mums, have been absolutely and utterly failed. We told him he couldn't go to school that day. And I literally saw the moment that his trust in us shattered. <laughs> he ran away from us and buried himself in bed sobbing, just as he'd seen me do on the kitchen floor. You get to spend lots of time with them, though, don't you? That's really magical. Of course, our children are magical and wonderful. 
But also, they're caged up animals, and they're not their usual selves. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. <laughs> he says, Mommy, that's been more than a minute. If you want my attention and I have to do my bloody job and I have to do everything, this is just not possible. Had enough of going to growth scans, had enough of going to consultant appointments, having enough, enough of having reduced movements with my baby and being worried sick and going into the day assessment unit and having to go on my own. It's not good enough. It's depressing and frightening, to be honest. Furious, angry, furious, upset. I'm at a loss financially, yet I raise these tiny humans uh, and do my job on the minimal amount of support. No, I'm sorry. Mummy is done. Absolutely done. So that was really harrowing testimony there that you um, have recorded from women on on your um, on the SOS line that Pregnant Then Screwed set up to to hear about women's experiences and mother's experiences during the pandemic so i'm just wondering how this connects to the broader issues that you're talking about yeah i absolutely agree with you and talk about this quite a bit in the book that flexible working is seen as this panacea but actually i mean flexible working is a broad term and it can mean lots of different things What we find is that in the UK, 40% of women work work part-time, which is a really high number. It's really high compared to the rest of Europe. And as I said before, part-time work is paid £5 less per hour than full-time work. And you are half as likely to ever be promoted if you work part-time than if you work full-time. So you end up on this mummy track. And it's a key problem for the gender pay gap. This is part of the cause of the gender pay gap. You you come back to work after having kids, you have become the main carer because you're the one that's taken maternity leave. You're the one that's doing all of the domestic labor. You know you can't return to work full time and be a good mum. You feel, well, you don't feel like you can at that time. I'm not saying it's not possible. Of course it's possible, but you don't feel, you know, you need a bit of slack, don't you? And so you go back to your employer and you say, please, can I come back three days a week with your begging bowl? Please, sir, please, could you let me come back for three days a week, knowing that you'll be absolutely amazing for those three days a week. And sometimes that's accepted. Sometimes it's rejected. Often what we find actually is employers try to push you into four days a week because then they don't, they don't feel like they have to change your job at all and they just pay you less. And so you just become enormously stressed because you're trying to do a full-time job in four days and trying to look after your children <sighs> yeah, and, and being paid less as a result. So um, part-time work is not necessarily the solution. What I see as a better solution is that we all, all of us, start to work fewer hours. We work the longest hours in Europe. We were crowned in 2019 the unpaid overtime capital of Europe. I mean, great. That's what a crown to be given. Um, And we know that this is really bad for our economy. It's really bad for our productivity. That actually, if we work fewer hours, our productivity would be higher. There is a direct correlation between the countries that work fewer hours and them having higher productivity. It just makes absolutely no sense that we force people, we feel that as employees, we feel we have to sit at our desks and that will make us look at look good to our boss if we're working really long hours when in actual fact for a big chunk of that time we're probably just messing about on Facebook but mothers cannot compete in that sort of environment because they've got to go and pick little Johnny up from childcare you can't just leave him on the street for a couple of hours and hope that it'll be all right when you get there we have to leave on time because we have these jobs to do and so in order to create a labor market that works for mothers we all need to work fewer hours but as a result that will be really good for our economy and really good for our productivity so I I sort of feel the, the flexible working, the, the notion of flexible working needs to be pulled apart a lot more. I mean, that, that it's also very important to say, of course, that for some women, the notion of flexible working is completely one-sided. It's only for, it's only for employers. If you're on a zero-hour contract, so you're in other types of precarious work, 
the notion of flexible working is really damaging because you don't want to work flexibly. You want to have some some certainty about when you're working so that you can manage your childcare, but you're not given it because you want a zero hours contract. So I'd like to see zero hour contracts abolished. I'd like to see us all to move to a four day working week or a six hour working day. And I think we'd see enormous benefits as a result. Yeah, and as you say, it destigmatizes working less if it's a solution that's imposed on men and women. Yeah. You're not perceived as being um, less committed um, as, a, as a mother. So um, just a reminder that we're going to come to your questions um, very shortly. So do um, carry on sending those in. But just finally, so we talked about working less and reducing that overwork culture um, that's affecting everybody, mums and dads. But what about childcare? And I, and I guess... The, the question about childcare is that good childcare with well-trained um, you know, staff is expensive. And those Scandinavian countries that we all look to, they have committed to, to spending a lot more than we are on childcare. And, and as the studies have shown, you know, contrary to the idea that childcare is bad for kids, the studies actually show, as you say, that, that um, childcare is, is really positive for kids and results in better outcomes. So how do we solve the, the childcare issue? Is, is it, do we, we're looking to sort of childcare at work or, or is it a, a state solution? I mean, really the best solution is a state solution. It is investment in childcare. And this, this would be an investment, not a cost. When I talk about childcare publicly, you all, I always get somebody saying, why should my money pay for your lifestyle choice? As if it's like a day out to the spa I'm asking them to pay for, rather than the education and care of, of the next generation in our society. Um, we know that for every pound invested in childcare, you get three pounds back because childcare means that parents can work, they can go to work and therefore contribute to the economy and contribute to their families. But it also has really good benefits on the education of those children. And once they move into schools, they do better in the school system, particularly children from more deprived backgrounds. What we're actually seeing with our childcare system is that the government is hacking away at it. And they're doing, trying to do it quite subtly. So during the pandemic, they've actually reduced funding to the childcare sector, which is complete madness because the childcare sector was already on its knees. Um, and they've done it in a really subtle way where they've, they've come out singing and dancing that they've invested, I think, 60 million in the childcare sector. What they haven't come out singing and dancing to, about is that they have started to fund childcare based on current occupancy levels. And of course, childcare, it, people aren't sending their kids into childcare at the moment. The occupancy levels are about half of what they usually are. So they're, they're losing all of this money. Um, so this, the solution really is investing in the sector so that we pay staff properly so that the standard is really good quality. It's got to be good quality for it to make a difference. You, you know, it's got, to, there's no point in investing in crappy childcare. You need really good quality childcare. Um, and as a result, you know, we, we will see enormous positive benefits. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to bring in some audience questions now um, and, um, and also talk a bit about what employers should be doing, both in terms of carrot and stick. <laughs> Um, so we have a question um, from Victoria here. I'm going to use first names. Um, and um, Victoria says, you know, thank you, Jodie, for sharing your, sharing your story. I'm so sorry that this happened to you. Um, my question is that um, my current employer does not pay any enhanced maternity, paternity or adoption pay, just statutory. Um, she's looking to challenge this as she can't afford to have a to have a child and she knows that others um, have left the company for this reason um, for a 21st century company that claims to be such a responsible business um, she feel, she and others feel that this is archaic so what advice could you give to people like Victoria who want to challenge this? Um, <clears throat> so the first thing to say of course that it, they have no legal obligation sadly to pay you anything above statutory and statutory is appalling it's six weeks at 90% of pay and then it's £151 a week uh, for the next for nine months until you you've been off for nine months and then it's nothing after that we have the third 
worst maternity pay in Europe. It's below minimum wage. So yeah, many families cannot survive on it and they get themselves into enormous amounts of debt. Um, the number of companies offering enhanced maternity pay is actually depleting as a result of the pandemic. Uh, they've obviously see equality as a nice to have. And so it's the first thing to cut as soon as the finances are looking a bit more ropey. But what employers need to understand is if they offer enhanced maternity pay, and their female employees will return when they're ready rather than when they feel that they have to. And all of the research shows that employees are more likely to stay with the company if they offer enhanced maternity pay than if they don't. And that's why companies do it, because they're aware of that. They understand that if they offer enhanced maternity pay, it will mean more they retain their female workforce. And if they lose women at that point in their lives, they're losing all of that money they've invested in them, which is, you know, often tens of thousands of pounds. So it doesn't make any sense to scrimp and scrape when it comes to this very short amount of time. If you really invest in women at this point, then you'll you'll see the benefits financially. So I'd, I'd give them some of those figures and say that this will have a negative impact you know of course on your mental health and your experience as a new mum and you want to feel that you are being supported and being looked after but show them some of the hard statistics as well about women more likely to stay and how much it will cost them if if they lose women at this point in their careers. I'm interested in just as a follow-up that you know your work at Pregnant and Scrooge and do you work with employers to to here you know there I'm interested in their challenges that they find implementing legislation and they're obviously under financial pressure as well so is is your work about you know um engaging with employers to try and change practices or is it trying to um you know constrain them top down through you know beefing up legislation and making access to tribunals easier for women it's both of those things so we do have a arm um, of Pregnant and Screwed, which is called Gendering Change, which is our training program for companies. So we do go into companies and train them on all different aspects of gender equality and how to keep and retain women in the workforce. Um, so yeah, we do both. And we do lots of talks as well to companies as well to help them understand what they should be doing and how to do it. We, we did a big programme in Manchester with the Manchester Mayor with Andy Burnham, lovely Andy Burnham, King of the North. And... Uh, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission trying to help Greater Manchester companies understand the importance of looking after women and eliminating pregnancy and maternity discrimination from their workforce. And we managed to get 140 companies to sign a pledge to say that they would do all of this work. And it was about half a million employees it worked out at. So we were really chuffed. And then we put them through this programme. So they went through a programme to kind of get rid of all the... Because it's, it's not easy, particularly for big organisations. You know, you can have policies coming out of your ears, but actually it's about how those policies are implemented. So it can be really complex. Um, but And companies need to invest in this properly and they need to be constantly monitoring it in order to understand where they're at. You can't just implement a policy and go, there we go, that's that's done. Sorted. We've sorted gender equality because we have a policy. It, you know, it needs a lot more work and thought than that. Yeah. So this has been such a wide ranging discussion and, and I suppose problems that women have combining work with family are really kind of the sharp end of the whole problem of motherhood and how badly it's managed by society um, uh, still even now. So I've got a couple of questions that, that sort of speak to that broader issue. One is that um, how good do you think is support for new mothers mental health, which is a huge issue in um, maternity and support for mothers, you know, um, postnatal depression is incredibly widespread, um, as you know. And another question that, that relates to that um, is, do you feel that the hashtag um, choose to challenge um, for this year's International Women's Day focuses too much on individual acts in individual cases without starting to address the fundamental structural inequalities faced by women? And you know, how can people make a difference to the status quo? What campaigns are there? So sorry, two very broad questions, but they speak to kind of feminist equality and motherhood problems with motherhood more generally. Uh, so postnatal depression, I'll pick up on that first. There's actually a debate happening tomorrow in Westminster exactly on this topic. 
um, the Liberal Democrat MP whose name is just gone out of my head anyway she's leading on this and they're doing some research before the debate and actually that that might have closed that survey might have closed now but she is really flying the flag on this and um it is a massive problem there's very little support for women there are some great organizations that um do some excellent work supporting women who experience postnatal depression i had terrible postnatal depression after theo and after jack not so bad not as bad with jack but certainly after theo and i w walked into hospital with both of them jack didn't sleep he woke every 42 minutes for the first year of his life oh my word it was horrendous and I walked into a &E with both of them and thought I'm not leaving until they fix the problem because I can't cope anymore I literally cannot cope anymore and <clears throat> I waited for four hours with both of them got called into the doctor's room explained the problem and she said this is not a, an emergency and you're in A&E and I said this is an emergency like I cannot cope anymore I'm losing my mind and they threw me out of the hospital that, and there was nothing. And thankfully I was fine, but we know that not everybody is fine. And there are these black holes across the UK where there just isn't this support for women. And Manchester, I was living in Manchester at the time, Manchester is one of those black holes. So there is a postcode lottery with postnatal depression and how women are looked after um, after they've had babies. In Australia, they've just invested millions of pounds in a new program for the mental health of mums because they understand the pressures the pandemic has had. I keep clicking refresh on the government website, waiting for them to announce the millions of pounds they're going to invest in mothers, but it just doesn't seem to appear. So we need, we absolutely need more investment in women. Mm. <laughs> and obviously the depression is about isolation and, you know, which can you know, creep up on many mothers in um, maternity leave and then perhaps if they're working from home, you know, they're more isolated. So they might go back to work, but then have all of those pressures that come from combining the two. So, but the other question, I guess, was, yeah, about, so they, they, things that individual women can do, you know, you have a great section towards the end of your book about, you know, what you, what knowing your rights and not being kind of grateful to your employer for whatever kind of scrap they throw you um, so it's really important to know your rights as an individual what action you can take but also as a society you know as women how can we combat these forms of structural oppression that women and in particular mothers and working mothers face and um, one of the key things you should definitely do is get to know your MP and if you're unlucky like me, you will have an MP who kind of has completely polar opposite opinions to everything from you. I'm sure my MP has a little file in his office where he gets emails from me and they just go in there never to be touched again. But you may find that you have an MP, even if they are on a different political party to what you would usually vote for, they may have some sympathies with some of the, some of the issues that you're talking about. So I would contact them, write to them, tell them about things that you, the issues and challenges that you are facing and um, they they may run with it and they may support that in parliament and you know really a lot of it really does come down to the political it comes down to legislative change and so MPs do hold the power to keep raising those things in parliament as you said you know really do understand your rights you should always have a really good grasp of your legal rights and share that information with other women, make sure they understand their legal rights. Talk to your family and people that are around you about gender equality, about some of these issues. When I first started Pregnant and Screwed, I had some really awkward conversations with members of my family. Um, you know, my mum, some of her opinions were a, a little worrying. But we talked and talked and talked about it. And now she gets it and she understands and now flies the flag for Pregnant and Screwed and the work that we do. So you were only going to really break down some of those deeply and transgender stereotypes and those ridiculously held beliefs when we have these conversations. So mm -hmm. just keep talking about it, no matter how awkward it is. Those are those are probably the two main things, I would say. Yeah, and we're, we're drawing to a close shortly, but I just wanted to ask you a question about International Women's Day. And I sometimes feel that it's a bit of a double-edged double -edged thing, that in some ways it's fantastic to have this day where women's issues and concerns and, and injustices are highlighted. But on the other hand, you know, 
it can function as a kind of safety valve you know we'll give you one day out of the whole year um so be happy with that so what do you what use do you think international women's day is i tell you what is really frustrating we know of loads of companies who win awards for gender equality who behind closed doors as soon as a woman gets pregnant they kick her out they say you've lost your job and they make a sign of non-disclosure agreement to gag her and then on international women's day they're all over Twitter and social media talking about how brilliant they are, the women, all the brilliant things that they do. We're at the moment, we're really actually watching the supermarkets because we've been very concerned about pregnant women. And we, we have written to all the supermarkets to ask them how they're looking after pregnant women during this pandemic and had the various responses back. And some of them have been appalling. So we're watching what they say today to see how that contrasts with how they're actually looking after women during the pandemic. So there, there is, it's, it's used a bit like Mother's Day as an opportunity to like sell a brand, which is incredibly frustrating. Um, it is important though, it's absolutely important to have a moment in time where we all coalesce around the fact that inequality still exists. And we talk about some of the data and some of the statistics and try and, again, remind people that we're, we're really not there yet. Even if you as an individual feel that you have equality, which we know lots of women feel that way, that actually there are vast inequalities um, across the world for women and that we need to work together in order to solve those inequalities. I was on a debate at the weekend the big question and I really wished I hadn't done it actually because who wants you know um, it's so ridiculous debating gender equality <laughs> why are we debating good or bad <laughs> yeah I mean what a ridiculous thing but there was there were two women on there one who was a stay-at-home woman said that you know the, the notion of patriarchy is completely nonsense and she has complete equality and has never experienced inequality another woman who um, said it, it was making some sort of slightly odd argument about equity and equality, which is a, a valid, you know, it, it, of course it's about equity more than equality. It's about, you know, um, but it it was so frustrating being, have, putting, pitting women against each other in a bid to talk about gender equality. We all want the same thing. We all, surely every human believes inequality every human believes that other humans should have the equal opportunities um, that they have um, and so I guess International Women's Day really is just an opportunity to have have our voices heard again and if and if one more man says when's International Men's Day today then I think we're all going to lose our minds <laughs> One more question. And it's so interesting that debate about equality, you know, I think it's, you know, there's often, it's not a debate for or against, but actually so many, particularly young people, think that women have already reached gender equality, that we've um, got that to that stage as a society. So therefore, really, it's about raising awareness that the, that the problem is still with us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even though, even if the argument's been won about, you know, what's right, um so so it's really yes and I, and all these problems that you raise in the book are i think so hidden so still and and that the sos line that you set up those recordings those um incredibly painful um uh, experiences really really illustrate that so vividly um that we've really only just started to scratch the surface of what mothers are are having to to um shoulder the burden that they they're having to deal with so um one last question before we close, um, and the, the quote from Boris Johnson that you cited earlier wasn't very encouraging about the children of working mothers being more likely to mug you. But if you if you could say one thing to the present government, um, one change that you would like to see, um, or what or one priority that you'd like to highlight, what would it be? Can I have two? <laughs> um, I mean, I, although I do like Sophie Walker, I've heard Sophie Walker answer this question before. Somebody asked her one thing she'd like to change. And she always says, I, I will not stand for there just being one thing for women. Women deserve everything, which is a very valid point. 
The, there are two changes I'd like to see implemented immediately. Those are ring fence, properly paid paternity leave and investment in our childcare system so that the workers that do this critical, brutal job of caring for our children are paid properly and valued for the work that they do. And so that we have a childcare system that works for everybody and ensures that parents can work and ensures that children receive critical education at the time when their brain is fusing together. You know, we know that 85% of brain development happens before the age of five. So let's give these kids what they need and let's give parents what they need and invest in our childcare system. Great. Well, Jolie, really, thank you very much for joining us and do order her book, Pregnant Then Screwed, which I thoroughly recommend. And thank you to the audience for your questions um, and enjoy the rest of International Women's Day. I hope it lasts all year. You know. So thanks very much. Bye bye. <laughs>